Good morning, church family. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. If you have your copy of God's Word, and I pray you do, I'd invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 9. If you're following along in the Black Pew Bible, it's on page 814. And I tell you, week after week, if you don't own a Bible, that Bible is now your Bible. It's a free gift from Oak Grove Baptist Church. We just ask that you read it and that you obey it. And at the last service, a young man about 10 years old came up and he had that black pew Bible in his hand. He said, were you serious? Can I really have this Bible? And I said, I was serious. But I was also serious when I said you had to read it and obey it. But he took it home anyway. So praise God. So pray for Michael, that Michael reads his Bible and more importantly that he obeys it. Uh, For those uh, men and women who stood a few moments ago, uh, thank you for your service. Uh, I've had the privilege of uh, officiating a uh, funeral at Arlington National Cemetery. And it is breathtaking uh, to see the way that uh, our fallen soldiers uh, are are remembered and are honored. Uh, We live in a great country. Uh, But we serve a great God. And that's why this country has been blessed. And my prayer for this country is that we turn back to that great God and that we seek his face, that we humble ourselves and pray. Because he says when we do that, he will hear us from heaven and he will come and he will heal our land. And our land needs healing. Uh, And I said at the last service, anyone who would disrespect that flag has never been handed a folded one. Uh, And and I believe that as well. So we need to pray uh, for our nation and for our, uh, for our country. Uh, September 11, 1992, one of the most unusual parking tickets ever was issued. 9.45 a.m., an officer arrived uh, for a Cadillac that was illegally parked. Uh, uh, there was no question that the, uh, the car was parked illegally, and the driver sitting in the, pa- in the driver's seat didn't even offer up an objection. Uh, the officer stood, he, he wrote a ticket, he handed it through the open window and put it on the man's dashboard, and then he realized why the man didn't object. He was dead. This officer had taken the time to observe a uh, traffic violation. He had taken the time to write a ticket. He had taken the time to tear it off and hand it over the man's now stiff body and put it on his dashboard without noticing that the man himself was dead. Um, the paramedics said that the fellow had probably been dead for about 12 hours when the ticket was given. Now we hear that and we're horrified. Uh, how can you see a dead person and not know they're dead? Well, friends, we do it every single day. We live in a dead and dying world. Some of us who have repented and trusted in Jesus have been made alive through Christ Jesus. Uh, Ephesians 2 tells us that we are dead in our sins and our trespasses, but God, who is rich in mercy, even though we were dead in our sins and trespasses, made us alive in Christ Jesus. And some of us have, have repented. Some of us have given our hearts to Jesus, and we have been made alive. But we are still surrounded by dead people. People, 150,000 people die every 24 hours in this world. People that you know. My brother-in-law died on Wednesday. Uh, Tuesday night, uh, Tina got a call. Uh, Bob had had been found on the floor and had had a heart attack. Um, His daughter, who was a registered nurse, resuscitated him, uh, called an ambulance. They shocked him again. They took him to the hospital, and they said he had just been gone too long. They had him on life support, and they had to let him go. Now, he woke up that morning, no idea that he was going to go to bed that night in eternity. And none of us do. And day after day after day after day, we walk past people and we look right past them, not knowing that they're dead. And unfortunately, too often, it's not that we don't know, it's that we don't care. Because we don't stop and we don't think. And we don't see people the way that Jesus sees people. You see, the world is spiritually dead. 
They, they, they are spiritually blind. They can't see the truth. They are spiritually deaf. They can't hear the truth. They're spiritually lame. They can't come to the truth. We are surrounded by a society of death. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that the wages of that sin is death. Now the good news, the good news that we should be carrying around is that but part. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Nobody has to go to hell. No one has to go to hell. We have the cure for sin, for sorrow, and death. His name is Jesus. And we have an obligation to take him out into this world. Now, the church needs to be awakened. Uh, the church has slumbered for a very, very long time. Uh, part of the awakenings is for disciples to start seeing people as Jesus saw people. If we go all the way back to the first chapter of Genesis, we see that mankind was created to have relationships. We were created for community. Uh, I think it's interesting that when we see uh, God creating Adam, he didn't create Adam and Eve together. He created Adam first. And that's because our first relationship is to be one and only with God. That first relationship that we're to have is that vertical relationship to God. The second is horizontal. It's with other people. That's the order of priority. And that's why it was just Adam and God in the beginning. Because from the very beginning, God wants every human being to know your number one relationship is to be with me. Now, some parents struggle with that because they want their number one relationship to be with their children. That's not the way it's supposed to be. That is not biblical. That's part of the problem in this country, I believe, is that too many parents have stopped being parents and they've tried to be friends. Well, when that happens, they're going to treat you just like one of their other friends. They won't listen to their friend. They won't heed the advice of their friend. They won't, certainly won't obey their friend. And if they're not doing it when they're little, they're not going to do it when they get older. Now, it's only when you have a right relationship to God that you will have a right relationship to other people. But it goes even deeper. When you have this relationship with God, you want to establish a relationship with other people so that you can bring them into a relationship with God as well. Now, we've been four weeks in our Everyday Disciple series. We've learned what a disciple is. We've learned about service, about worship, about sharing. We know that Oak Grove exalt, exists to exalt the Lord Jesus, to know him and make him known. We, we know that we want to turn every member into a minister, and we want to turn every saint into a servant. So today we're going to talk about creating relationships that glorify God. One of the reasons Jesus came to this earth, other than to save us, was to show us who God is and to show people what a relationship with God looks like. Jesus had a three-year earthly ministry, 156 weeks, and we're very familiar with the last week of Jesus' life. But what did that other 155 weeks look like? What did he spend his time doing? We're going to find out today in the Scriptures. We're going to see that, that he wants us to make personal connections with, other, with one another. Now, some people will, will confuse communication with connection. Right? So what I'm doing right now, prayerfully, is communicating. Uh, so right now, I'm communicating. Before the service, when I walked around and shook hands and, and listened to people and talked with people, that's connecting because connecting is a very, very personal Thing. Now, we're going to look at what Jesus did in the gospel, gospels, I should say, and see how to make a connection with other people. We're going to learn that you can't take people where they need to go if you don't connect with people where they're at. And we're going to be reading out of Matthew's gospel, chapter 9. It's on page 814 of your Black Pew Bible. It's up on your screen. And if you're able, I'd invite you to stand for the reading of the Word of God. Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 35. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. 
When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming to you in prayer. We thank you that we can approach your, we can gather here together in this place, sing songs of praise, open up your word, and listen to you speak to us, Father. And we thank you for that privilege. I pray that we never take it for granted. I pray that your Holy Spirit will flow freely among us. I pray that he will teach us and grow us, Father. Conform us more into the image of Jesus. And it's in his precious name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus tells us three things that we need to do in order to effectively share the gospel. First, we need to connect proactively. Verse 35, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every... Well, of course, Daddy would say, I drove 400 miles to North Carolina. You all can come and see us. That didn't go over real good with the family. But that's what Daddy did all the time. He says, I'm at Cora Sue's house. I'm staying right here. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus didn't just come to earth and say, oh, by the way, I'm going to put out a shingle to let you all know that I'm in business, and if you want to, you can come by. Jesus proactively connected with people. Jesus took initiative to come to sinners and bring them into the kingdom. He went looking for people. I, th I think that's absolutely amazing. Jesus was proactive in his ministry. Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for this, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Luke 19, 10. Jesus said, for the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. He came to seek it out. He came to find it. He came to look for it. That's what Christmas is all about. Love coming down from heaven. And friends, we need to go after lost people like Jesus did. If we call ourselves disciples, we need to be like our master. And that's what Jesus did. He made proactive connections with people. You see, church is not a resting place, it's a launching pad. We come here, and, and that's a good thing. We come here to fellowship, to serve each other, to encourage each other, to learn but this is all just to get us ready to leave the church and to go out and find people who aren't in the church. And I don't mean Oak Grove. I mean the kingdom of God. We need to go out and proactively find people that don't know Jesus, make connections with them, and then do our very best to bring them into the kingdom. You see, we come to church to worship. We go out into the world to work. Now, Jesus didn't just go to people. Jesus went with a purpose. He was teaching, he was preaching, and he was healing. Because people are disconnected in mind, in heart, and in body. And that's why we have so many weekday ministries at this church. Uh, we, we try to connect with those who are disconnected in their heart. Ministries like Adam, like Reboot. We, we have a grief... Uh, counseling group that gets together called Mornings Coming. You might not have even known that. But maybe you just lost a loved one and you're, and you're suffering, from, suffering from that loss. And, and you would like to sit down with Christians who, who know the biblical way to grieve. As the Bible says, we, we grieve, but we don't grieve like the world that has no hope. But that's a wonderful group where you can get together and you can have your needs met and you can meet other people's Needs. We connect with those who are disconnected in their mind. We emphasize the teaching and preaching of the Word of God from this pulpit and in our small groups, transforming and renewing the mind. We, we try to connect with people who are disconnected in their bodies. And that's why we have a, a food pantry. That's why we have a clothes closet. That's why we, on the 8th of every month, serve at the Welcome One Homeless shelter. Did anybody know that? Oak Grove, on the 8th of every month, is the church that has, has agreed to, has volunteered, 
to serve at the Welcome One homeless shelter over in Riverside. Get involved in that. Get involved in a Sunday small group. I hope before you came here to worship, you, you, you left that upper, uh, upper level here on, on the first building or one of the other uh, buildings where we have Sunday school. Because you need to be involved in a small group. You need to be involved in a place where you can connect with one another. We have a benevolence fund here that helps people pay their rent, provide for their family, pay their car payment, their BG&E. We help people out. Now, some people will say, well, are you preaching a social gospel? Absolutely not. The, the two main tasks of the church is to teach the Word of God and preach the gospel. Now, the gospel ought to be sociable, but Jesus never preached a social gospel. He didn't come primarily to heal the sick. He didn't come primarily to work miracles. He didn't come primarily to raise the dead. Jesus came primarily to preach the gospel, to gather the harvest, and to bring people into the kingdom of God. Dr. Vance Habner one time said, if they had had a social gospel in the days of the prodigal son, somebody would have given him a bed, a sandwich, and a welfare check, and he would have never gone home. And listen, we need a benevolent fund. We need benevolent hearts. Oak Grove needs a benevolent spirit. And praise God, this church does. I, 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 am, I am proud of this church. I am proud of the way this church meets the needs of other people. But we never do it without bringing the gospel to them. For what does it profit a hungry man to be fed? What does it profit a naked man to be clothed? What does it profit a man with no shelter to receive shelter and lose his soul? To never hear the gospel. And that's why every ministry at this church must and will revolve around the good news of Jesus Christ. No matter what we do in this church and what you do outside this church, it should always have Jesus involved. If you give somebody money for gas at a gas station and they say thank you, you say don't thank me, you thank Jesus because this is his money anyway and if it, he hadn't changed my heart, I wouldn't even stop to talk to you. Because that's what Jesus does to us. He changes us and he gives us a new heart and everything that we do should bring him honor and glory. Listen, Jesus didn't get paid to do what he did. He wasn't ordered by anyone to do what he did. Uh, Wednesday night at the Way of the Master uh, class that, that I've been teaching, I asked the class a rhetorical question. And I said, please don't answer this. If you got paid $1,000 to share the gospel, how often would you do it? And I didn't want anybody to answer because I didn't want to think less of anyone. Because if you would share the gospel for $1,000, guess what, friend? You're not worshiping God, you're worshiping money. And Jesus said, you can't do both. How valuable is a soul? What price can you put on a life? What, life, what price can you put on a soul? Jesus paid that price. He paid it on the cross. And he paid for it with his flesh and with his blood and with his life. And friends, we've got to get out of our holy huddle. And we've got to get out into the world, into the neighborhoods and the marketplaces and the ball fields and the schools. And we have got to proactively connect with people who are disconnected from the Lord. Second, we need to care passionately. Jesus began to connect with this, these people where they lived and where they worked and where they played. And guess what he saw? Verse 36, when he saw the crowd, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. Now, when I read that, that convicts my heart because I have to think to myself, do I see a crowd the way that Jesus sees a crowd? Am I seeing the things that Jesus sees? Because most of us don't like crowds, particularly post-COVID. 
People don't like crowds anymore. I know that when I go to get my, my groceries and I come over that hill at Walmart and I see that parking lot jam-packed, I'm saying, oh, no. There's going to be a thousand people in here. Well, how many times have I said to myself, instead of, oh, no, say, oh, God, give me the opportunity to share with one of these Walmart shoppers what you've done for me. Because the passion may not be there. Jesus had that passion. He passionately cared for people. Nowadays, if you're in a crowd and somebody coughs, they run away. Unclean! Unclean! And the devil loves that. Satan does not want us to gather together in this fellowship. He wants us to be fearful that we're going to catch a bug. Well, you know what? If you catch a bug and you catch a death, Jesus is going to catch you in the end. You don't have to have any fear. You don't have to be Be smart. Be safe. But don't be fearful because God has not given us a spirit of fear. Too often we view crowds with contempt and not compassion. Jesus was moved with compassion. You see, he saw those people. He looked in their eyes. He saw their fear. He looked in their hearts and he saw their hurts. We see the forest. Jesus saw the trees. Do we really see people the way that Jesus saw people? Do we see our neighbors that way? Or our teammates? Or our friends? Or our co-workers? Or even people that live in our own houses? Do we really look at them and ask God to help us to see into their hearts and discern their hurts? I'm afraid that too often many of us don't see people. We see past them. We don't stop. We're like that cop writing that ticket. We don't see what's right in front of us. See, Jesus had compassion. And that word compassion is kind of sanitized in English. Uh, splanknon, that's the Greek. And it means in your bowels. Yuck. That's gross. It, it almost means like getting a, a gut punch. Jesus saw these crowds and he had such a, an emotional reaction. It was like somebody punched him in the stomach. He could see their hurts. He could see their tears. John 11 tells the story of, of Lazarus. And how Jesus looked at the crowd and he had compassion on them. To the point that Jesus wept. John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus loved people, and he cared passionately about people. When we start to see people the way that Jesus sees people, we're going to start caring for people the way that Jesus cares for them. And when Jesus looked out at this crowd, he didn't see people. He saw a flock of sheep without a shepherd. Now, these sheep were harassed, verse 36 says. They were harassed, and they were helpless. That word harass literally means to skin an animal. In other words, these folks had their hide tore off. Uh, life had kicked them around. Life had, had, had just decimated them. They were mangled. They were frustrated. They were angry. They were betrayed. They were hurt. You name it, they were it. And if you take a look around, you're going to find out that everybody has got issues. Somebody say amen. amen. Everybody hurts and everybody is hurting. These people had been flayed. But they were also helpless. And that literally means to get knocked flat on your back. The Greek means to be cast down. Like a sheep. Have you ever seen a sheep fall over? A sheep will just lay there. They can't get up. They're kind of like turtles. They, they roll around and roll around. They can't right themselves. And listen, we, every day we work with people and we play golf with people and we hunt with people and we fish with people and we live next door to people who are barely making it and who are struggling through life. They're tired and worn out and I may be preaching to one of them right now. Try, trying to fix a, a marriage that's in peril. 
trying to fix a child that's prodigal, trying to build a business, trying to tread water and barely keeping their head above water, like a sheep without a shepherd. And a sheep without a shepherd is dead meat. Because they'll either get attacked by an animal, they'll wander off and die, or they'll just starve to death because sheep are some of the dumbest animals in the world. We need to begin to see people as sheep without a shepherd and understand that our role is to lead them to the shepherd who can give them the water that's going to quench their thirst and the food that is going to fill their bellies and the shelters that they need to protect them. When we start to see people the way Jesus saw people, we're going to start to feel for people the way Jesus felt for people. And when we feel for people what Jesus felt for people, we're going to start to do for people what Jesus did for them, which is go to them and love them and gently and kindly do what we can to steer them to the good shepherd named Jesus. We will passionately care for people. Finally, we need to commit personally to people. Verse 37, he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, Jesus is looking out at these people who are harassed, they're helpless, they're hurting, and and what they needed was people who were going to connect with them, to care for them, and to commit to them. Now, what did he tell his disciples to do? Spring into action, guys. Go out and do all these things. No, he didn't tell them that. He told them to pray. To pray. Does that surprise you? It, it kind of surprises me. Because when the, when the 5,000 needed feeding, Jesus didn't say, hey, go pray. He said, go find them something to eat. But here he tells them to pray. He doesn't ask them even to pray for the sheep, but to pray for more shepherds. Because Jesus here is talking about a harvest. He doesn't ask them to pray for a, biggest, a bigger harvest. He asks them to pray for more harvesters. And I wonder right now how many of you would be willing to pray a prayer to God that sounds something like this. Father, I'm asking you to send those of us who call ourselves your followers into the fields where we live, where we work to help us to see people the way that you see people, to help us to feel for them the way you feel for them, and to help us to do for them what you have done for us. And if you would pray that prayer, I would also ask you to say this, Lord, start with me. See, Jesus asked the disciples to pray that he, the Lord of the harvest, would send laborers into the harvest. And it's actually kind of funny because here's what the next verse says, Matthew 10, 1. And he called them to, and he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Be careful what you pray for because Jesus may just answer that prayer. And that's what he's saying to them. He's saying, boys, thanks for praying that prayer, and you yourselves are the answer to it. Amen. We need to start seeing people the way Jesus does. We need to start feeling for them the way Jesus feels for them. And then we need to start doing everything that we can to bring them into his kingdom. When we do all that, we will reach their mind, their hearts, and their bodies for Jesus. Now that word in Greek, the Greek word workers, it means common, ordinary, hourly workers on a farm. And what that tells us is that you don't have to be seminary trained, you don't have to have a college degree, you don't even have to have a certain personality to share the gospel. The greatest work you're ever going to do is to get into the harvest and become a worker planting that good seed of the gospel. You plant the seed and let God do the rest. Because there is harvesting that needs to be done in businesses in Harford County. There is harvesting that needs to be done in the neighborhoods all over Harford County. In the schools, in the ball fields, all over this county. Guess who is supposed to take it there? We are. Now you say, well, Jim, I don't really know a lot of unsaved people. Well, I have good news for you. It's good news and bad news. Bad news is they're everywhere. The other news, the good news is, is that we have a tool called Bless Every Home. Go ahead and flip that slide up, please. Bless Every Home. 
If you, if you go to blesseveryhome.com, you can go in there, you can register your name and your address. So the staff has already done it. You can pick your church affiliation, Oak Grove Baptist Church. The, the address will pop right up because we are one of the sponsoring churches. And what will happen is every day you will receive an email uh, with a, a group of people, at least five names, uh, names and addresses, of people who live in your vicinity. Now some of them may be church affiliated, they may not be. But there are people that you probably don't know, because in America we don't know our neighbors anymore, unless they trespass. But this gives you an opportunity every day to pray for these people. You know, when I got on there, I didn't use my home address, I used Oak Grove Baptist Church, because I'm, I'm here more than I'm there. And what I found was, there are people that live on Prospect Mill Road that I went to high school with, I had no idea lived over there. So what I've been doing is, I've been taking their names and their addresses, and I haven't just been praying for them. I do every morning when I first, first get into my study. I, I get that email up, I get those five names, I pray over those people. But then I get out my, my cards, and, and I, I send them a little, little note, a little handwritten note. Just wanted you to know that you've been prayed for, that Oak Grove Baptist Church, we believe in ministering to our community, and we want to minister to you. If you have any prayer needs, please let us know. Now, they may take that card and say, ah, those crazy Christians, throw it in a trash can. Or they might be one of these people who are harassed and helpless that say, somebody cares about me. Somebody has taken the time to not only pray for me, but to send me a card. Who knows what that could lead to? It could lead to eternal salvation. And you have that opportunity now. As your pastor, as your friend, I want to encourage all of you. Go onto that website. It's a safe website. I, I promise you, I wouldn't tell you if, if, if it wasn't. Put in your name and your address. And, and we'll be able to see, uh, I say we, Matthew and I, because we're the administrators, we'll be able to see who has affiliated with our church. We'll be able to see that you picked our church. And we'll be able to see your, your area where you're praying for people in this county. Don't think it doesn't matter. Jesus said, pray. Other opportunities to share the gospel? This coming Friday, Richard, Richard talked about First Fridays when he first got up here. Great opportunity to share the gospel. You're going to be down in Havity Grace. It starts at 4 o'clock. There's a big tent that says Oak Grove Baptist Church. So when people come by, you shouldn't have a problem sharing, your, sharing the gospel. That They already know you're affiliated with the church. The worst they can say is, no thanks. But it will give you an opportunity to be with, with people who regularly share the gospel. So if you're not comfortable, you can see how it's done and say, wow, there's no, there's no secret formula to that. You're just connecting with people. You're caring about them. You're being proactive. You're committing to this ministry. Now, maybe you're saying, well, wait a minute. I'm not ready to go out like that in public. Well, we have VBS coming up July 18th through the 22nd here. We're going to have a ton, prayerfully, a ton of little lives coming into this church to hear about Jesus Christ. And we want you to be a part of it as a church we want you to be a part of this ministry and teaching these little ones. You say, well, I'm not a teacher. That's okay. There's lots of holes where you can be plugged in. Teaching is not the only uh, serving area here for VBS. We have a place for you to be able to make connections that will lead others into the kingdom. Many years ago, churches used to uh, go out and put outdoor crusades uh, at, at football stadiums. And, and they would do this all over the country. They would rent out a local high school football stadium. They'd invite somebody famous to come and speak, and then the pastor would get up and, and, and preach the gospel. There was one church that, that invited Pittsburgh Steelers quarterback, Terry Bradshaw, to come and give his testimony. Now that night, a man by the name of Pacey Cohen was driving home to commit suicide. Now, for some reason, he took a different route home, a route that he never took, that took him by this uh, football stadium. Now he saw a sign outside that said, here Terry Bradshaw, quarterback of the Pittsburgh Steelers. It just so happens that Pacey Cohen was a big Steelers fan. And he thought to himself, you know what? 
I'm going to give myself one last thrill. I'm going to go listen to my hero, Terry Bradshaw, talk, and I'm going to go home and kill myself. Now, he went inside to the stadium. After Bradshaw got done with his testimony, he left the stadium because he had to catch a flight back to Louisiana. And there was nothing there keeping Pacey Cohen at that stadium. But he said he couldn't leave. For some reason, he couldn't leave. Now, Pacey was Jewish. Pacey had never been to a church, and he had never heard the gospel in his life. The pastor got up, preached a simple gospel message, and gave an invitation. Now, there were 3,000 people in that stadium that night, and he was sitting in the very top row of those bleachers. He began to watch people going down those bleachers, onto that field, giving their lives to Christ. He didn't move. Now, just as the pastor was about to finish, he said something that he hadn't planned on saying. He said, there is somebody here tonight, and it will be your last night on earth if you do not come and give your heart to Jesus Christ. You will not be alive tomorrow, and you will spend eternity in hell, separated from God. Now, Pacey said, if you would have interviewed him, he would have said right then and there that he believed the preacher was looking him dead in the eye. And when the choir sang the last stanza, Pacey Cohen walked down into that field to receive Jesus. The next Sunday, he was baptized and he joined a local church. Now, the real twist of the story is that he became a full-time evangelist for Jesus Christ. He spent the rest of his life leading other people to Jesus. He came to that crusade to kill himself, and instead he spent the remainder of his days leading other people into eternal life in Jesus. Only Jesus can do that. Pacey Cohen, a few years later, died from lung cancer. And towards the end, it had gotten so bad that he could only breathe for a, about 60 seconds without an oxygen mask. His wife said that the day he died, with his last breath, he led his nurse to faith in the Lord Jesus. God took a heart that was rock hard, and he replaced it with a heart of flesh. Jesus left the throne of heaven to come and die for you. He was put on that cross. On the cross, he said to Telestay, it is finished. Paid in full, all those sins were paid for. On the third day, he walked out of that tomb, and he is alive. He is ruling and reigning from heaven right now. He did all that because he wanted to proactively connect with you, because he cared passionately for you, and because he was personally committed to you. Our job is to go. God's job is to grow. You do your job, and God will do his. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are a passionate, loving, proactive, and personal God. We thank you, Lord, that although sin had stained us crimson red, that through our faith in you we are washed whiter than snow. Lord, we'll never be able to wrap our hearts and our minds around the mysteries of the gospel, but by faith we accept it, and we thank you for it. Father, for those here today who don't know you as Savior, my prayer for them is that your Spirit will do what only your Spirit can do, and that is convict their hearts, reveal their sin to them, and drive them to the cross. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So I pray today, Holy Spirit, that you will show them that way, lead them to that truth, and impart to them that life that's found only in Christ Jesus. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. If the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to you and you would like to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, the Bible says he's faithful and he is true. He will do just that. The Bible says that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you've done. The Bible says that by coming to Jesus in repentance and faith, he will wash you white as snow. Maybe you need to be baptized, maybe you'd like to join our fellowship, or maybe you're just one of those hopeless and hurting and harassed people, and you need somebody to pray with you. Our staff will be down front, so please come as the Spirit moves you. 